Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce Jean-Francois Bias from the University of, of South Florida. And he has made the trip over here from Seattle um, this afternoon where he is attending the QIP conference. And he is uh, so friendly to give a talk to us as well about his work, uh, which we are really interested in because it, it relates to uh, the work on post-quantum cryptography that we are doing in that it uh, looks at algorithms to solve certain problems that we think or hope are uh, difficult. So without further ado, uh, welcome. And well, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. I don't know if I need the microphone. I mean, it's on, but yeah, well, it's, yeah, so I'm just going to put it aside. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I want, I want to present a few, um, uh, some of my recent work on, on quantum algorithms and why, and why, and, and, it, and especially those that, you know, have some kind of, you know, that pertain to cryptography. So, but first, you know, you, you, cannot, you can hardly talk about post-quantum cryptography without reminding, you know, you know, without being aware that, you know, we're all there doing post-quantum cryptography because uh, it has been shown that there was a way to build a quantum computer that would solve, uh, that would factor integers and solve the discrete log problem in polynomial time. And, and of course, the reason why it's, it's really, um, it's really concerning is that most of our um, most of our public key uh, crypto crypto systems that are currently deployed, they either rely on on RSA, which is essentially um, um, integer factoring, or the disk clock problem. So, if we don't want our post quantum world to look like, on the one hand, you know, the, the desperate users and evil entities uh, having a, a quantum computer and being able to crack you know, basically all the keys, then you need to think of alternatives. So alternatives to um, RSA-based crypto systems and, and DLNP-based crypto systems. And there are, I mean, I wouldn't say, I don't wanna say there are alternatives. There, there's been a lot of serious proposals for uh, alternatives to, um, to, the, the, to the currently deployed uh, 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 public key crypto systems. So that includes uh, lattice-based crypto systems, uh, what they call multivariate cryptography, so relying on the hardness of finding solutions to systems of polynomial equations, code-based cryptography, where you may basically use Macaulay's crypto system uh, with some random codes, and then you hope that um, that will be intractable for an adversary. Isogeny-based cryptography is something that I'm, I'm gonna say something about uh, during this talk. It, it, it's of interest to the people in Microsoft, so probably they, some of them probably know more than me about the subject. But I think it's, I mean, what I'm going to talk about is quantum algorithms that relate to the security of, of these schemes. So um, I would like to, so what I, I want to present quantum algorithms. I think it's really important when you talk about post-quantum cryptography to really look at the quantum algorithms. Uh, and so... I meant that talk to be a little, you know, to not assume too much knowledge about um, uh, quantum algorithms. So, what can we, what can we say from a very high-level perspective about uh, quantum algorithms? Well, a qubit can be many things. Um, so, well, I will say that in my case, a qubit will be a cat in a box. Okay, and the box has a door. And the box, inside the box, there's some kind of syringe that's going to inject the cat with either a placebo or some kind of poison. And, and whether it does, you know, if, inject the cat with poison or placebo is some randomized process. And, and, the, quantum, and the quantum state of, of this whole thing is, well, it, it, it's like a, it encapsulates the probability that the cat is dead versus the cat is alive, okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's a formalism that was introduced by Schrodinger uh, as one way of looking at a, a quantum system. And, well, so what can I do? Well, I can do all sorts of things to this system. I mean, okay, that one is not very interesting. It has only one qubit. But you can do many things, and then ultimately you're going to measure it. And here a measurement can be 
for, you know, can be described as opening the door and checking whether the cat is alive or dead. So you go from a situation where the cat has, say, a probability alpha uh, to be dead and 1 minus alpha to be alive. So you describe the state by those probabilities, essentially. You say, well, you know, the, the, probably the cat is in this, you know, alpha, alpha alive, uh, oh, sorry, alpha dead, one minus alpha alive sort of state. And once you open the door, you can actually check that the cat is dead or alive, and which collapses the, the system into a new, uh, a, new, a, new, a new quantum state where at that, that time, it's, if it's dead, then it's 100% chance dead, 0% chance alive, okay? So we're going to see a little bit later, like how, later in the talk, how really um, the quantum states are massaged through uh, quantum algorithms. But before I get there, I want to say that, you know, dealing with only one qubit is not necessarily very interesting. So a two cubic system could be, you know, two cats, each in their own box. Okay. And then, well... Then, you know, you have this phenomena of, you know, like how those, two, how those two elements of your system interact with each other. So if, if your system is just a direct product, it means basically that the two cats are, you know, things that are happening to those two cats are completely independent, which means you open the door here, you'll see what happened to that cat and it has no influence on, on that one. And that, in that case, we say that this is a, a direct product of, of those two components. But they can also be entangled, which means, for example, one, one very simple way of having entanglement in that system of cat and boxes is to say, well, imagine that those syringes that inject the cat are injecting it with probably alpha and mon minus alpha, but injecting each cat with the same thing. In that case, you open the door here to check the state of that cat, it will tell you everything that cat, but also that one, because you know they've been injected with the same thing, okay? And that collapses the entire thing into a new state where cat is 100% dead or alive. So now the, the, the interesting question is how do we um, manipulate quantum states, okay? And that's, that's really the important part with a quantum algorithm. But before I get there, um, so before I get there, I want to, I want to, present the general sort of formalism for the uh, algorithms that are of interest for us. So there are many ways of, of describing uh, quantum algorithms, but there's, people noticed that the, a lot of the problems in computational number theory that are of interest to cryptographers could be, uh, could be made part of the same sort of framework where they're rephrased in, as the problem of finding a subgroup, a hidden subgroup. And the way, um, the way you would formulate it very precisely is assuming you have a function from R to the M to a bunch of quantum states, okay? Remember, quantum states could be my cats, but, you know, it could be also all sorts of physical systems. And such that the function hides a discrete subgroup of R to the M. And hiding it means that your subgroup is the periods of your function, so your, your function cycles back every time it hits an element of your secret subgroup. And, and that means, and so, and f first of all, of course, you have to rephrase your problem in terms of finding, you know, solving my problem has to, uh, rel has to, um, has to boil it down to finding this secret discrete subgroup G, okay? And so, the most, I mean, important I mean, the most important uh, hidden HSP-based uh, quantum algorithm for cryptographers is, of course, Shor's algorithm. Okay, factoring an RSA number in polynomial time, and the way it works, well, it has a, it uses the quantum algorithm kind of like as a coprocessor. There's a little part of that algorithm that's actually completely classical. So what it does is, well, given n whose factorization is unknown. Find a co-prime number with n. Note that failing at finding a co-prime element to n is essentially solving your problem. So that search is certainly not a problem. And then you would like to have an R such that 
a to the r. So you want to, yeah, sorry, yeah, let r be the order of a mod n, OK? And then if r happens to be even, you have this, OK? Which means, uh, which means basically that knowing r will give you an equation of the form um, x minus 1, uh, x plus 1 equals 0 mod n, or the product of two things being divisible by n. Okay, and with good power and with, with good enough probability, this will give you a non-trivial uh, factor of n. Not all the time, okay, but but you know it, it. You repeat the experiment if it does not. And here is the function that will hide your subgroup. So first of all, what is the subgroup you're looking for? Well, you're looking at the subgroup of z defined by R z. Okay, R is the order of a mod n. Knowing R essentially allows you to write down an equation of this form, and most of the time, I mean, not most of the time, with a constant probability, it will get you a non-trivial constant factor. So you want to find r given a. And so that is the same as finding rz given a. And then your function could be expressed in the, uh, this way. You start from z and you uh, associate a, a to the x mod n, and then you encode that in some way quantumly, okay? And then every time you hit an element that's a multiple of the order of your, um, of a, then it will reset, right? Because a to the r is congruent to one mod n. That's definition of r being the order of a mod n. So what it means is that you have exactly the right property to your function, you know, that your function hides the subgroup Rz of Z. Solving the HSP formulated with this function here will essentially give you a non-trivial factor of, of your number. So, so that's how, that's not how, that's not how it was originally described, but it's clearly uh, how it can be made into this, uh, you know, fit into this general framework of, of hidden subgroup problem. So um, now, what does a computer, quantum computer do? Well, so here's the thing. Uh, quantum states, they're described by vectors in c to the 2 to the, into, c to the 2 to the n, okay, where n is the number of qubits. Um, so, and it gives you basically uh, each coordinate is essentially the probability of being in a certain state, okay? So two to the n, there are two to the n different states. For example, here with one cat, n equals two, okay? Uh, sorry, um, n equals one, and there are two possible states. Then you have two cats, n equals two, and then there are four possible states. So you would, you would describe this uh, quantum system as a vector of two, um, sorry, a vector of four coordinates and each coordinate will describe the probability of being in a certain state. So of course, as such, the sum of those probably have to be one. Now, what's funny and what allows um, really interesting things to happen is that the, the coefficients are in C and not in, uh, in, in R. So the probabilities are complex. So what you're saying, uh, they all sum to one because the probability of measuring a certain, uh, a certain um, value is this, okay? So absolute value of, of the coordinate i uh, square. So that's the probability of getting i in, in this vector when you measure, when you measure the, the, the quantum system. Now, when you, when you have a, a quantum algorithm, what it does is it, it's the same, I mean, for each quantum algorithm, basically, you, you, could, you could have a unitary matrix in C to the 2 to the n times 2 to the n. And then it takes the input state, here I call it phi, you multiply it. So remember, quantum states, they're just vectors. So you can multiply, it's just a matrix vector multiplication, gives you a new vector, which describes the new probabilities of being in you know, um, all the, the possible outcomes of a measurement. And as long as, so, and this is of course an infinity of, of potential unitaries. And then basically that's how you can modelize your um, uh, quantum algorithms, quantum algorithm. And so that's what a quantum circuit looks like because usually instead of having a unitary 
uh, in one go, you know, if, if you want to implement a quantum algorithm, what you want to have is a circuit. Just like, um, just like the classical computers, they have, um, I mean, you know, you could have all sorts of circuits, but the way you would actually do it is you want to break it down into a set of, like a universal set of gates, like, uh, you know, NAND, for example, and then rewrite, you know, have your manufacturer only, only work on a very restricted set of, 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 of uh, logical gates. And then you want to you wanna build your circuit of a very small set of gates. So in, in, um, in, the quantum, in, quantum, in quantum algorithms, you know, even though, you know, the circuits can all be, uh, you know, arbitrary unitaries, then there are ways to rewrite those unitaries in terms of, say, for example, um, a Clifford plus the T gates. Okay, so that's like a universal set of gates. And, and then, you know, it will look like something like this. And then at the end, so you start with an input state, you'll get an output state, and then you measure, and you hope that that measurement will give you your, the answer to your problem. Usually, what it will, what happen, what's going to happen is the measurement will not necessarily give it to you, it will give it to you with good probability, is usually what happens. Because remember, a lot of the things here are probabilistic. So as far as the HSP is concerned, one main ingredient is what they call the quantum free transform. So that's this ugly state. And another one is, uh, if you know a circuit for the function f that hides your, your discrete subgroup of r to the n, you're going to apply it to this state, and you get this funny double sum here. And then, so, oh, I don't like double sums. They, they freak me out. But what, 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 what is this? Well, it's, it's um, a sum of many different vectors. And what happens when you measure it? So here, there are quantum encodings of, of vectors. And you sum over all possible vectors. In, in a certain region of, of, of the, the hyper, you know, of, of z to the k. Um, so what happens is, when you measure, you'll get a vector, okay? So now, your vector has to answer your problem in, so, in, in, in some way. And it turns out that what works, re what, what makes it work is the phase here. When this dot product here is close to one, then when you carry on the computations, you can see that, that your probability of measurement of x is high, which means is, what it, what it means is these y's are in the lattice that you're trying to construct. And the fact that x times y is close to an integer means, in fact, that you're hitting um, a vector in the dual lattice. So what happens when you make this measurement here on, on this quantum state is that well, you can prove, you know, once you, once you carry on the computation of prob probabilities of drawing a certain x in z sub n to the k, is that you're, you're going to be more likely to draw vectors that are in the dual lattice. So basically, you create those states, and then you measure those states, and hopefully you get vectors in the dual lattice. Okay? Now, what does it have to do with anything? Well, the dual lattice, it's exactly what you get when you solve Shor's algorithm. I mean, for those of you guys who, who, who see Shor's algorithm, like the original description, you know, they'll tell you, well, you, what you want to find is R, but what you really find is a multiple of 1 over R, and, that, and that's how it's phrased. And then you, you reconstruct it by, you know, uh, looking at a um, continued fraction expansion. But what really what, what's happened, finding a multiple of 1 over R really is finding a, an element in the dual lattice of a one-dimensional lattice generated by the vector r, you know, that one coordinate. So it's all about measuring vectors and hoping that they're close enough to the dual of the lattice, and then using classical techniques to go from the dual lattice to the actual lattice that you, you're trying to, I mean, that will hopefully answer your problem. So discrete log problem also uh, formulate, can also be formulated in terms of a uh, hidden subgroup problem. So um, now moving on to um, more uh, number theory. The, so that k, a number field, O, the maximum order, class group, just the fractional ideals, quotient by the principal ideals. So it's not really important, actually. I left it there. But what's really interesting here is that problem, the, what's called the principal ideal problem. 
So given uh, an input ideal, usually my ideals would be with uh, Gothic letters. So let's say you're looking at an ideal in the maximal order of a number field. The principal ideal problem consists of deciding whether or not you're looking at a principal ideal, and if so, finding a generator, okay, which will be just a field element. Now, what does it have to do with anything you know, regarding uh, cryptography? Well, it turns out there, there's been a series of recent work that show that, in fact, if you do have an oracle for finding generators of principal ideals, then you can threaten the security of, of, of some lattice-based crypto systems. So there's one, so one family of, of, of lattice-based crypto systems. It relies just precisely on the hardness of, of finding a short generator of a principal ideal. So, and these include so multilinear maps, uh, some candidates for uh, multilinear maps. So multilinear maps, they allow you to do some like a discrete um, Diffie-Hellman key exchange um, protocol with more than two people. So, so people were, got excited with that. The other thing that it uh, allows you to do is people noticed that there was some malleability in that form of encryption and then you could do some uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes. And also, and that really didn't go well, some people thought, oh, because there's lattices involved, chances are it could also be um, post-quantum, so quantum safe. So that really didn't go well because it turns out, uh, in some recent work, uh, Kramer, Duca, uh, Piker, and, and Regev, what they, they did is they showed that, that this problem of finding a short generator of a principal ideal, it in fact, reduces polynomially and classically to the problem of finding some generator, at least in some settings, which was the relevant setting for cryptography. That's uh, psychotomic fields of, of, a, of a power of conductor of power of two. So essentially, the fields that were used in cryptography. So solving the PIP it gives you, you know, after that you can you can attack it in in poly time. And so if you solve the PIP the, the principal idea problem in polynomial time with a quantum computer, then you have a polynomial time attack against. Well, pretty much everything you can think of that relates on the short um, on the hardness of finding a short generator of principal ideal. So, so that certainly that certainly was a little um, concerning. Now, now people are like, okay, can this also um, help you find short vectors in lattices that are just you know ideals and but not necessarily principal? So it turns out that the shortest generator the shortest generator of principal ideal is a short-ish vector in your ideal. And by that, I mean it's a solution to gamma SVP. So gamma SVP is the shortest vector problem with approximation factor gamma, okay? So, you know, if you can solve that with short gamma, then clearly you're threatening the security of, of a lattice-based crypto system. And then when gamma is a little bigger, well, in this case, the shortest generator of a, of a principal ideal, it's, it's a solution for gamma SVP for an approximation gamma that, that is, let's say, um, not very small, but also not completely large. So it's, it's worth mentioning. And it turns out that, so in general, so first of all, clearly that means that gamma SVP will reduce to the PIP in, in this, for this kind of approximation factor. And then in, in principal ideals for sure, in arbitrary ideals, you can also do it by simply saying that you can find the right multiple of your non-principal idea to first you know, push it into a principal ideal and then deal with that principal ideal. So, and that's been uh, done by Kramer, it's another Kramer at Al actually, it's Kramer, Duca, and Fosilovsky for that recent paper. Um, so what's interesting about it is that that means that if you assume a quantum uh, polynomial time algorithm to, to find <coughs> generators of principal ideals, what it means is you have a solution for gamma SVP for that approximation factor gamma in polynomial time, why classically uh, BKZ will, will give you a, a sub-exponential time complexity. It's like an exponential square root n type of runtime. So you have one of those highly sought after super polynomial improvements over the classical state of the art. And people really like that when you come up with an algorithm uh, that works in poly time for quantum computers for a problem 
that no one can seem to find a solution with you know efficient solution uh, with with uh, actual uh, with regular computers, and even more interesting is that this is a lattice problem. So of course people are very excited about whether or not lattices you know lattice problems can be solved efficiently with quantum computers. So that that's an example. But of course these lattices are highly structured. So there are many, many buts. You know, one of them is that the, those um, lattices are highly structured. This, generali this generalization is, in fact, heuris heuristic. Uh, so there's a lot of caveats. But, but still, like people were that, that, that people found that relevant to uh, lattice-based cryptography. Now, um, here's how we do the um, we find our uh, solutions to principal ideal problem. So finding generators of a principal ideal, we make a little detour. Instead of tackling the problem of directly, we go through uh, like a more general thing, which the more general problem, which consists of finding the group of S units for a certain um, S of uh, a set of prime ideals. So an S unit, given a set of prime ideals, it consists of finding the group of X in K such that the decomposition of the principal ideal generated by X is a product of only primes in the set of S, is in a set of prime S. So that's the S unit group, okay? Um, and so the, way, uh, so the way we did it is by, so by reducing that to the hidden subgroup problem, for which we know that we can find uh, efficient uh, quantum solutions. So, being an S unit means that there is some kind of product of the PIs in S such that that ideal multiplied by those PIs is the trivial ideal. And that's how we're going to define a function that hides this group of S units by saying, well, take elements in this horrible set. Um, yeah, and I'm not going to be, basically that, that, that is uh, made of, of what you need to be embed the number field into R to the N. And you associate elements in this complicated set to lattices and lattices to quantum states. And it turns out that when you do it that way, okay, every time you hit a pair that corresponds to the complex embeddings of your S units and the valuations of that S unit at the primes, then this thing is going to be trivial. And that's how that function basically hides your S unit group. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, like there was a little too many equations, but bottom line is you can hide the S units, okay, with a function that satisfies the good properties to be called a, a hidden subgroup problem that can be solved in poly time. Now, once you do that, you may wanna know how do I reduce, say, my problem of finding a generator in a principal ideal to uh, and the computation of a certain S unit group. So the way you do it is you take your input ideal and you factor it um, as a product of prime ideals. And then the set of primes that you're going to use when you compute your S unit group is precisely the primes that divide your input ideal. And then, well, your input ideal is principal if and only if it is sorry, if and only if it, is, uh, it corresponds to the decomposition of an S unit, okay? So to find an S unit, uh, sorry, to find, to so first find the S unit group, and you know that, you know, if your principal, if the, sorry, if the ideal you, you gave your algorithm as input is principal, then it means that it will be a principal ideal generated by an S unit for that set S by definition of the fact that we put in S all the prime divisors of A. So then it just boils down to a simple linear algebra uh, system that you need to solve where uh, the unknowns are the valuations at the primes. So it's a very simple sort of classical reduction. Aside from that little factorization at the beginning, everything is essentially classical. So you're, you're just looking at a, at a linear system and it tells you whether or not your, your principal ideal that you, 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 you gave as input, I mean, your ideal as given as input is principal, and if, it, and if it is, 
it will also give you the generator for the same price. Okay, so that's just to say that principal idea problem, which we said was important for some of the ring-based crypto systems, is in fact just um, uh, just, just reduces to the S-unit group problem, which itself is a hidden subgroup problem. Now, principal idea problem is not really the only thing you can do with that. And it turns out we had all sorts of so we had all sorts of, um, I mean, we looked at all sorts of uh, um, um, problems in computational number theory that, that are not necessarily relevant to cryptography. So I'm not going to give a lot of details in, in that, but on that, but, you know, computing class groups and unit groups, uh, these are one, break class groups, another one. Um, related norm equations, that, that's actually nice because it relates to the resolution, of, I mean, the, the problem of, of solving Diophantine equations, which is a, a big problem in number theory. So you have, we have a, a list of, of interesting uh, problems in computational number theory that can basically be solved by using the knowledge of S, S units for a certain well-chosen set S. So it's not just for cryptography that we were looking at, at it. And now, I want to talk about the hidden subgroup problem in a non-abelian setting. So in particular, another uh, type of proposals that I, that I was mentioning at the very beginning of the talk was isogeny-based uh, crypto systems. And as we're going to see here, I mean, there's a way of reformulating the problem of funding and isogeny between two curves as a hidden shift problem, which itself can be reformulated as a hidden shift, as a, as a hidden subgroup problem, but this time in this weird and a weird semi-direct product. So, I don't know exactly um, how much uh, knowledge on isogeny and isogeny-based cr uh, crypto system the audience has. Uh, is there anyone working on it besides you? Patrick, and then no one else? Well, it, well, then it won't hurt because it's happening. So, the, so, um, so as I said, um, we're going to talk about isogeny-based crypto systems, and I'm going to actually define how they work. Um, so that's why I'm not really assuming a lot of knowledge here on, on elliptic curves or isogenies or anything. So basically, uh, we're going to show that we have an algorithm for computing uh, isogenies between elliptic curves, and it relies on identifying some weak instances and searching for them. So, F is a field, and the elliptic curve is, is basically, uh, I mean, the group of points of elliptic curve is basically solutions to that and some points at infinity, okay? And um, so, I mean, w the only thing that we need to pay attention about in the definition is that we, are, we have ordinary and super singular elliptic curves, and when it comes down to the computation of isogenies, which I'm going to define in a few slides, well, it's really not the same. So you have two different types of elliptic curves over finite fields, and we'll see that at some point when it comes down to uh, the security of, of the schemes that rely on the hardness of, of, of finding isogenies between curves, that will have its importance. So, as I said, the group of points of, of elliptic curves, uh, so the, all of the, the roots of that equation plus the point at infinity, their group. So what it means is there's this famous um, uh, tangent and court uh, way of, of, of calculating uh, P plus Q. You, you, know, you, you, you search for the third intersection and then you, you take the symmetry, as like the, the yeah, symmetry with respect to the horizontal axis, and that gives you P plus Q here. So you can follow that recipe, and it will, it will give you an, uh, a group law, basically, on, on the points of elliptic curve plus the point at infinity that you can't see on the plane because it's infinity. So yeah, that gives you, that gives you a group. Now, the isogenies, the morphisms between those groups. So let you know, E and E prime be, uh, be some um, um, elliptic curves, then uh, an isogeny between them is a morphism uh, that has this form. And what's interesting about that morphism is that knowing its kernel 
is essentially just as hard as calculating it. I mean, I'm oversimplifying here, but that's really the key to um, understanding, you know, how those um, uh, crypto, uh, crypto systems based on isogenies work. So they're going to basically, when you cook up isogenies, what you do is, in fact, you look at the subgroups of a certain curve to choose a suitable kernel. Okay, so, and of course, yeah, they have degrees as well. And then these are degrees of the, of the, um, uh, of the algebraic maps here. So, okay, so first of all, let's, um, let's see how a zero-knowledge protocol could be implemented with isogenies. So Peggy knows an isogeny between E and, okay, every time, you know, C1, if C1 is the kernel of the isogeny, then the, the, the curve that it maps to will be denoted E quotient C1. That means the isogeny you obtain by uh, choosing the kernel C1, which is a subgroup of E, okay? So Peggy knows an isogeny between two curves. So those two curves are public, okay? There are two uh, groups, I mean, groups of points plus the point at infinity. And then Vic needs to be convinced that Peggy knows an isogeny between those two curves. Now, telling Vic what is the isogeny certainly sells down, I mean, it sells it, right? But the problem is we want to make a, a zero-knowledge proof of that knowledge, which means we want to convince someone we know something without actually revealing what we know. So, okay. So Peggy publishes another curve. So here it's when you choose C2, another kernel, which gives you another morphism to, from E to another curve. And E where this time you quotient by, you know, the, the group generated by those two. Um, so that's a, that's a third kernel, okay? But, you know, knowing that, knowing that information about C1 and C2 uh, gives you also that information, right? C1, C2. So Peggy uh, knows all those curves, and obviously, knowing all the, the quotients, I mean, sorry, knowing all the kernels, Peggy would know how to calculate any of, of these isogenies going from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here. Now, Vic is going to challenge Peggy to give one of these directions, okay? So Vic will flip a coin, and then if it's zero, the, uh, she's going to ask for, which one is it for zero? So she's going to ask for the morphism between E and C2 and between, oh, that's it? Well, okay. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, if it's zero, then she's going to ask for this morphism from E quotient C2 to E quotient C1, C2, okay? And then Peggy will give it to her because she knows, okay? Because she knows all the directions. And then if it's one, then she's going to ask for the two vertical morphisms here. And Peggy can, knowing all the kernels, Peggy knows how to produce those, those uh, morphisms. Now what's important, of course, is to not disclose any path that would go from E to E quotient C1. So for example, if you, if you publish both the vertical and the horizontal one, then there's going to be a problem, right? Because you don't want the adverse, you don't want uh, Vic to be able to learn the, the path from E to E quotient C1 because that's the, the data you tr you're trying to protect, okay? And then you repeat that protocol many times and, you know, the chances of you being successful not knowing, not knowing that direction, E goes to E quotient C1, well, it's, it's essentially, um, it gets exponentially bad after a few uh, coin tosses. So, that's one way of doing a, an isogeny protocol uh, based on isogenies. Sorry, um, zero-knowledge protocol based on isogenies. Now, you can also do key exchange based on the general philosophy of, of, um, of uh, the Diffie-Hellman problem. So I, some of you guys are probably familiar with the Diffie-Hellman protocol, you know, Bob and Alice exchanging G to the A and G to the B, and that's, that's familiar to everyone here. Okay, so this is going to be something that looks a lot like Diffie-Hellman, but it's not quite Diffie-Hellman. So they want to create a shared secret. That's always the same setting for a key exchange. Okay, and what they do is 
they start from a curve E, and then they, they have base points that are public, P sub A, Q sub A, P sub B, Q sub B. And then Alice is going to use P sub A and Q sub A to create a kernel. So that's a subgroup that is going to be generated by a certain combination of PA and QA. And then Bob is going to use P sub B and Q sub B to create another subgroup that, you know, generated by some linear combinations of PB and QB. And then they're going to try to exchange enough information for everyone to land on the same curve at the end of the exchange, and that curve will be the secret. So they draw uh, MA, MA, NA, okay, and then they compute a first isogeny, okay, which they keep for themselves, and each isogeny corresponds to a kernel, okay, and well, then they send some of the images, so basically Alice with her uh, secret isogeny, first isogeny phi A, will send the image of the base points for Bob, okay, which are public. And Bob does the same. And then they manage to each create a, and I'm going to have a little uh, picture on the next slide where it's a little more visual. But what happens here is that both Alice and Bob will create a kernel based on that, that will combine that information that will land in fact in the same thing. So they both have the same isogeny as the secret key. So what it looks like is like this. So uh, Alice, is that Alice? Yes, that's Alice. So Alice looks at the kernel that's the group generated by this secret point here, okay? And publishes this, okay? And goes to that curve. And Bob does the same, okay? So it means that we have two curves at that point, but none of them is the secret. Then, okay, then Alice can use um, Bob's phi B of PA and, uh, sorry, yeah, phi B of PA and phi B of QA to create another, a, a second isogeny that goes in the same direction here. You know, using, using if you got, you got to make a good choice of PAs and, and PBs and QAs and QBs, and I'm not going there. But what happens is, when Bob does the exact same thing, they both land on the same curve here. Okay, and that's really how it works. They've exchanged something using their secret information, and no one ha that can actually um, eavesdrop this conversation will be able to uh, figure out where they both landed. But they've, yeah, but they, but they've, they've published those curves, e, e sub a and e sub b. Okay, but no one knows where they eventually land. So now here is how you can do a little bit of. Um, uh, here's what we're going to do to um, uh, solve that isogeny problem. So finding, yeah, maybe I should go back a little bit. If someone is suddenly capable of finding isogenies between curves, then that gets a little, uh, that, that can compromise this thing. I mean, I don't want to get into the details of how exactly, because the this spe this specific scheme depends also on the degrees of the isogenies that you're looking at. So it's not even clear. If one isogeny will break everything, this isogeny the right degree. But the bottom line is, you really don't want people to be good at finding isogenies between two given curves. Okay, in this case, you know, if you publish e to the a, and then maybe it will give you the secret, and then you can play Alice's role in this whole thing, and then land on the secrets. So now let's see how you can use a quantum computer to compute isogenies, and let's see if it's if it's actually hard. So. We're going to need that ideal class group that I didn't want to really talk about before. So ordinary curves, and that's when that's where ordinary and, and super singular curves, they differ in that sense, is that the ordinary curves, their endomorphism ring, so the ring of all their endomorphisms, is isomorphic to uh, a certain ring within uh, a quadratic, quadratic number field. Now, we're going to have to define that object because it's going to play a central role in the evaluation of some isogenies between two given curves. So the ideal class group is you look at the fractional ideals of that ring and you quotient by the principal fractional ideas, which really means that every time you know, an ideal is equal to another one times a principal factor, then you just identify those ideals. And that gives you that group, the class group, is in fact a finite group. Okay, 
of a very large cardinality. Like when, when the discriminant goes to infinity, we're, we're talking about a really large group here. And the way this group relates to the computation of isogenies is because it acts on the isomorphism classes of, of elliptic curves whose endomorphism ring is, is isomorphic to, to the ring here. So, and, and it acts via an isogeny. So it means that when you, the action of, of a certain class of an ideal is made by an isogeny of degree its norm. So there's a, re, there's a correspondence between finding an isogeny, say, between uh, E1 and E2, and finding the right ideal that will, you know, act on E1 and get you E2. Okay, so that's that's why, and that's also what we're going to use for quantum algorithm. So, um, yeah, so that action, if I give you a the ideal a, we know how to compute it. So, and I don't want to. I realize that that's going to be a little technical, so I'm going to breeze through this. Just trust me that we know how to do this. Okay, if I give you a we know how to uh, take that action like a star e1 and get e2. And the way we do it is we have all sorts of formulas. Let's just not talk about it. Now, knowing that we know how to do it, then it becomes our goal, really. If I give you e1 and e2, what I really want, if I want to find an isogeny between e1 and e2, what I want is to find that a and use all the magic formulas that I have working with a uh, to calculate the corresponding isogenies. And the way, the way it's formulated, in, for, as you look at the function that takes uh, classes of ideals and, and evaluate the action of this class to, um, on the curve. And the thing is, if, you, if I give you two curves, then those two functions will be a shift of, of one another. So, Basically, what I'm saying is if E2 have an isogeny, if there's an isogeny between E1 and E2, then I can take the function where I have F sub E1 and F sub E2. These are two functions, and I know how to evaluate them. And it turns out that I should be able to notice when I evaluate them a lot that they're, they're a shift from one another. And the corresponding shift is exactly the, the ideal A that acts on E1 and gives you E2, which I said is what I want to find. So in that, there is an algorithm, the quantum algorithm, that's, that's called the, uh, the hidden shift problem. And it's essentially, it essentially boils down to a hidden subgroup problem in a weird, bizarre, semi-direct product, so not a commutative group. And in particular, because it's not a commutative group, it doesn't work as well as the hidden subgroup problems that we were talking in the previous, in the first part of the talk, it's not palm yield time, but it's still sub-exponential, which means that, for example, people were not so happy about ordinary curves for, um, you know, using uh, uh, isogeny-based crypto systems. Now, they say, well, that's fine. Let's go with super-singular curves. So, super-singular curves, their endomorphism ring is a maximal order in, 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 a, in a quaternion algebra. And in particular, not commutative, so all the things that we were mentioning before, they don't work. Now the question is, of course, is it just because we get, got rid of the commutative property, is that really a problem or not? Well, what we found is that there are, I mean, based on other people's work, uh, but we adapted it for the quantum setting, we realized that, in fact, there are weak instances. In particular, the uh, supersingular curves, those that are defined over FP, where P is the characteristic of your field, these ones, we were able to prove that, in fact, you can reuse the trick for the ordinary curves the, to build a quantum, I mean, to design a quantum algorithms that will find it in, in goodish time. I mean, it's shortish time, like, like sub-exponential. So the main strategy is to say, well, you're going to travel the isogeny graph. So, you know, try to find your way isogeny by isogeny until you reach a weak curve on both sides. So you want, a, you want an isogeny between, say, um, 
E and E prime. And then first, you travel the graph of isogenies till you reach on both sides the weak curves, and then you find an isogeny between those weak curves. Okay? So turns out the isogeny graph looks like this. You know, you start from E and then you travel. And then every time, you know, it's highly connected. So you get lost very quickly. Okay. And the thing is, you're gonna search for all the paths that passes that pass through a curve defined over FP. And it's a search problem. And one of the magic of quantum algorithms is that they can do search problem in, in time better than linear in this in the size of the set through which they search. So it's called Grover's algorithm. And what it does is if you're searching a database of, of length of, of, uh, of size n, it'll find what you're looking for in time square root n, even though the, the database is not um, ordered or anything. Of course, if you, know, if you search through an, an ordered list, it's easy. But if you have no idea of any structure in your, in your database, it sounds a little mind-blowing that you can find something in, in time less than linear in the size of that database. Okay, here our database is a, is a set of, of a lot of different paths that you could take and you're going to search through, uh, through this for all those paths that, that go through a weak curve. And then once you do that, well, you can move on to the next stage, which is dealing with the weak inst instances. So what's special about the weak instances? Well, their endomorphism ring, I mean, their ring of endomorphisms defined over FP has just the right structure to use the trick that we were doing before for the ordinary curves, okay? What it means is basically everything I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna wave my hands and I'm gonna say everything we did for the ordinary curves, you can do it for the weak supersingular curves once you found them in the highly connected graph of isogenies, okay? So because then, you know, you have your nice commutative ring and everything works just the same way. So what it means is, because of your Groverized search, even in the, even in the case where you're dealing with non-weak curves, you know, there's still, you're still shaving a factor two in the exponent. You go from O of, of P of the one half to O of P of the one fourth. And if you happen to look for an isogeny between weak curves, in fact, what's going to happen is you, you have a sub-exponential time algorithm, so like a super polynomial improvement over um, the exponential time algorithm. Okay, so so that shows that you know although although the super singular curves, although they have a very different, they work in a very different way with their, their ring of endomorphism being completely different, it's not completely guaranteed that there's nothing you can say. Um, so people say, well, you know, they're so different. There's no way anything we do for ordinary curves can 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 apply. When it's not it's not clear. We should scrutinize it more. Now, um, how much time do I have? Because uh, we started a little late. Uh, how did, what was the the plan? I have like a few more slides on totally. Un, I mean, not unrelated topic, but um, just different. So I could stop here or I could talk about. What I'm going to say at the QIP run session, which is I'm going to talk about a, a super polynomial slowdown on Shor's algorithm. So making Shor's algorithm slower. Yeah, it's meant to be a, a run session talk. So here's the thing. You know, uh, you know, to, to so the community is like, okay, well, let's uh, let's um, you know, because of Shor's algorithm, we're forced to look at alternatives to RSA, you know, like uh, lattice-based cryptography, multivariate cryptography, code-based, isogeny-based, you name it. Now, in joint, in joint work with Dan Bernstein and Mikhail in Moscow, we have an alternative strategy to uh, solve this problem of, you know, the, the concerns of the community with respect to Scholl's algorithm, is to just make it slower, okay? So, let's see uh, what we really mean by that. So polynomial time, so Shor's algorithm gives you a solution polynomial time. Now the best solution to um, the, the polynomial factoring n with uh, classical computers 
is um, in uh, sub-exponential time. So sub-exponential is defined by that funny function here. Uh, we call it sub-exponential because when that first parameter varies from 1 to 0, you go from something exponential to polynomial, and whatever, whatever it's in between is called sub-exponential. Okay? And clearly, if you go from a sub-exponential algorithm, I mean, sub-exponential algorithm to a polynomial time algorithm, this is what we call a super polynomial improvement. It's not just shaving off a factor in the exponent. It's, it's really fundamentally faster. Okay? Now, if we want to slow down shores, maybe we should use a little bit of the, 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 the method that's, that, that works slowly classically. Okay? So what does, how does it work? Like the number field sieve for factoring uh, RSA integers in a nutshell, the way it works is it has many, many, many integers that you need to factor and find those that can be expressed as the product of primes bounded by a certain bound. Okay? So you have this very large number of smaller integers than the one that you're trying to factor. And then you want to factor them all and keep those that are the, the, the product of small primes. And then you do all sorts of abuse on those numbers that I'm not even going to talk about. Now, our hybrid approach would be, well, now, well, how about using shore, not to factor the big number, but to factor the small numbers. And how about using Grover to search through all the numbers and find those that are products of, because I said Grover, the Grover search is this magic trick where instead of when you, when you search n, n elements, then it takes you square root n time. So it sounds a pretty natural thing. And it turns out this is the runtime that we get. Okay? Um, so sub-exponential still, and then this is a second uh, coefficient. So what's, what's really, the, so the objective is attained in the sense that this is asymptotically worse, worse than, than a polynomial time algorithm. So that, that is the, our, our complexity, and this is the complexity of Shaw's algorithm. So clearly ours is much, much worse. However, this is a little bit concerning still because that time is also asymptotically better than the best uh, uh, asymptotic uh, classical runtime. So it outperforms anything else that exists at the time. And also, the number of qubits is, uh, in our method, is, um, oh, uh, yeah, Shor, so Shor's number of qubits is, is O of log n, while ours is O of log n two thirds. And the number of qubits is, in fact, very important when it comes down to uh, the feasibility of, um, of a quantum algorithm because it quantifies, you know, like, roughly speaking, the size of a computer you'll, 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 you'll need when it comes down to actually implementing it. So people are saying, well, you know, Shor's algorithm is going to take so many qubits, a.k.a. it's going it's gonna, to it's gonna require your, your computer to manage so much quantum information that we have so many years before us, before it actually, you know, quantum computers actually make a difference in factorization. Now, what it says is that, well, you know, there are other ways, maybe not as efficient, but it would still make a difference because, you know, it's, it's asymptotically smaller and, and it would require less qubits. So, well, in fact, it's not that reassuring. It's the whole point that I was trying to make. So, well, thanks a lot for uh, your attention and the invitation. On the very last line that you got there, do you know anything about the constants for the, uh, the orders, um, the uh, log n to the two-thirds qubits? Is that really fewer qubits in practice, or is it just constant? Well, okay, that, that, that is, uh, there's actually two questions in there. So the constant itself, in what I meant here, actually, from the top of my head, I can't tell you, but it's probably something that could be worked out. Now, it doesn't necessarily tell you how many qubits you actually need. So this is a different, and that's a different problem, is the problems of, of fault, uh, fault tolerant, a fault tolerant implementation, okay? So maybe, I, I think we could easily narrow down the actual constant here. For example, people have been also like um, figuring out the constant here in Shor's algorithm. So it used to be the like, oh, it's gonna be two times log n. And now people are like, no, in fact, you can do better. You can have log n. And we could play the same kind of game and tell you exactly which number here. Now, that would not necessarily tell you how many actual qubit you'll need 
prefer a fault tolerant right. implementation. And that depends on uh, other factors than sure. our ability to count. It's the error correcting codes that are used. And so you got to make some, right. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm accustomed to telling people that the factor in the integer, you need two n logical qubits. And two n minus one gets you nowhere. And what this is telling me is that, well, maybe 2n minus 1 can do something with. And that's where the constants come in. Sorry, 2 sorry, can you? Sorry, you, the, the number, yeah, if you factor in all of the, the error correction, mm -hmm. um, and you get logical qubits as a result of this. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to factor, say, a 2048-bit integer, mm -hmm. you need roughly, or you as need, of now, sorry. As of now, with of the now. current state of the art, right. you would need with sure as I would, you need forty ninety six logical or forty ninety seven two n plus three. I think is These the are point. logical still. Log logical. So I'm telling you, that's better than that. There is a result where they can actually get it to uh, log in. I think there is another result based on di uh, simultaneous diophantine equations. So something about diophantine equations, like a I think someone else, like not Shore's paper, but I think there's another paper that gets it down by a factor two. Okay, so you can do this in 2048. I think so. That's to be confirmed, like I, I think, I think I, I can't tell you from the top of my head the, the actual reference, but I think it's been improved by someone. Okay, the result over there though um, would indicate that for sufficiently large n, you can do even better than that. Oh, absolutely. But two things here. The caveat is twofold. First of all, um, you can do better, but at, a, at, a, at the price of a worse asymptotic sure. runtime. So that's one thing that yes. gets to, it has to be stressed. But the other thing is that um, you got to look at the fault tolerance implementation. And the devil is in the details because it turns out that the search circuits that goes through you know a very large number of ends, that size of a circuit is sub-exponential. And the, 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 for now, the best bounds that we have for fault tolerant implementations, they will be proport like the, the, the they will they, basically the, the overhead will be proportional to that. Okay? Now it's been conjecture, conjectured that there are families of codes for which you, you don't have that bad of an overhead that is directly proportional to the size of the circuits, okay? But with the current technology, we're only, we're only showing a better number of logical qubits. If you go to a fault tolerant implementation, it will blow up because the size of the circuit for sure is smaller than the size of the circuit that we're talking about here because of the big search. It's too big of a circuit for the current technology in terms of fault tolerant implementation. I still don't get the slowdown argument. What you basically said, if I understood it right, is instead of running Shor's algorithm directly, you can kind of run number field SID where you use other quantum things mm -hmm. or parts of it, mm -hmm. and that doesn't run as fast. As Shor. As Shor. But it's faster as the. But it's faster than number field SID done completely classically. Yes. Okay, so that I get, but no one would do it that way. If they had access to a quantum computer with sufficient bits, and uh, with sufficient bits, that's yeah. The, yeah. So then, so then, the only way that you're getting a slowdown is you're trying to play off this small delta here in terms of the number of logical qubits you need, <clears throat> and you'd have to argue that you would then have to size the 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 composite, the public keys that you're using in RSA, so that it was basically exceeded the number of quantum bits you could build and run shores on directly, but didn't exceed the log into the two-third factor, right? I mean, that's kind of what the argument is, right? Pretty much. Okay. Okay. Basically, it's, it's an argument about when, when, are going, when are the quantum computers going to make a difference? And right. and the, the, when an people look... There's an intermediate step that can be taken. That's kind of like what we're saying, yeah. Which is, which is I can take NFS and I can apply yeah. smaller quantum yeah. computers. So a hybrid computing. technique okay. will, will, will s possibly will be feasible before full-fledged okay. Shor's uh, implementation. I would, I think that, that positive statement, 
Mm -hmm. which is, hey, there's an intermediate step here mm -hmm. that we should be aware of, mm -hmm. is a better way to say what you just presented. Oh, but that's a rump session talk. I understand. <laughs> I understand it's a rump session talk. <laughs> so, and you start with a provocative title, and I've been down that path. But yes. I think there, that's... And that, that's what we wanted. That's how we're selling it for real. Okay, fair enough. Don't worry, I'm aware of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did that far in academia, <laughs> not by saying everything is crap. No, no. But yeah, that, that's right, that's no, right. It's, yeah, it's I, an important I, that, that's, how, that's how we're yeah. phrasing it, yeah. don't worry. And, and well, no, I actually think that that is an important statement because one of the problems yeah, we're, we, yeah. we're, we're seeing it exactly that way. Yeah, okay. Well, so with the isogeny systems, uh, I mean, in the classical case with RSA, we're happy with a sub-exponential algorithm. Can yes. we be happy with the ordinary curves if they would have an advantage over super singular? You mean an advantage in, term, mean, in terms of uh, performance? Maybe, yeah. So you, if you're, tell, you're telling me I, I reviewed the crypto systems based on super singular curves and ordinary curves, I have a mind-blowing implementation with ordinary curves, what do you make of their security? Um, so it's only a sub exponential algorithms that, that we have. Now the question is, um, well, it, I think it's it's like it's the thing about cryptography. Like some of the stuff in cryptography is just a little irrational. There's there's that component, irrational component. So RSA has been studied for so long, and it was first to the market, and people are. People are happy with that L one third algorithm, uh, while with super singular, sorry, with ordinary curve isogeny, we only have a well one and a half. With a quantum computer, which you know, uh, God knows what it would look like for real, a quantum computer running something in L one half. But people don't like. People really want to see, like, for a new system, it looks like people want to see exponential time everywhere. The moment you start to tell them that there is sub exponent, especially if it hasn't been studied for that long, and suddenly, so it could be that sub exponential is the best, L1 half is the best we'll ever do for ordinary elliptic curves. But since it came like rather soon after it's been described, then people think, oh, come on, like, you know, like they almost think that there's a curve of, you know, complexity in time. And, you know, if, if, if we interpolate that curve and if you got to L1 half and so, you know, such a, it doesn't mean anything, right? It, it's really, a lot of it in, in cryptography is, is psychological. So, yeah, there's no good answer to your question. Not, not good, nothing scientifically uh, good. Thank you.